good morning. Check, check. I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts and minds, healing brokenness. I feel a generation breaking through despair. I hear a generation full of faith declare. In our song, it will be out of the darkness, we will rise and see that He is faithful, He is glorious, and He is Jesus in all my hope. right now he is hope and joy and love and peace and life I have seen a light like the break of dawn giving blind men sight letting lame men walk i see a generation with resurrection life we are a generation filled with the power of christ and our song it will be Out of the darkness, we will rise and see that He is faithful and He is glorious and He is Jesus in all my hope is in Him. He is freedom and He is healing right now. He is hope and joy and love and peace and life. He has paid the highest price. Proclaim my love for him. He has paid the highest price. He has proven his great love for us. We will praise him with our lives. And proclaim my love for him. Oh, and proclaim my love for him. Because he is faithful and he is glorious and he is Jesus in all my hope is in him. He is freedom he is healing right now he is hope and joy and love and peace and life
as well. Would you join me as we pray? Father God, we thank you for being the God and worthy of worship. We proclaim our love to you. We are truly, truly blessed people today. Oh, Father, as we spend this time this morning corporately together worshiping you, may we draw close to you. May that be our desire this morning, is to be closer to you. And in so doing, Father, may we this day hear from you, and may we be changed by you. May we pursue your face, all that you are, more than your hands, all that you do. That we would recognize what it means to be in your presence, to have you in our lives, to be filled with your spirit. And from all of that culminate together as we leave this place later in the morning, that we would go recognizing that the need for us to proclaim our love for you resonates in our lives in such a way as to where people might see you in our lives. And they too might want to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity as we continue to worship you, your name, and all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise And teach me some melodious song yeah, Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. And here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. And I hold by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of all blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious.
precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come, thou fount of all blessing. Come, thou fount, come, thou King. Come, thou precious Prince of Peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come, thou fount of all blessing. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. And all I I surrender, give me faith to trust what you say, that your good and your love is great, I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I need you to soften my heart, break me apart. I need you to pierce through the dark and cleanse every part of me. Your spirit strong in me, 
my flesh may fail my god you never will i may be weak but your spirit strong in me my flesh may fail my god you never will give me faith to trust what you say that you're good your love is great i'm broken inside i give you my life i love you lord and i lift my voice to ushers come forward. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we could come together Last from different Sunday. backgrounds, from different generations. Um, God, we just thank you for your love, and we thank you for Jesus, God. And at this time, God, we give uh, something back to you, something that is yours. Um, and God, I pray that um, your will is done with it. God, thank you for giving us all that you have given us, and thank you for Jesus. Sing on that last phrase, I am with you to the very end. It's the idea that, that we are not alone. We never are alone. Even though many of us would identify times in our lives where we feel very much alone. We feel as if no one understands the pain or the circumstances in which we face, no one could possibly identify with. But the truth of the matter is, there is one who, who can praise the Lord. Grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 16, if you would. Luke chapter 16. We'll read from a text this morning. It's not going to be an exposition from this particular passage as we're continuing on in this series, actually concluding with this series that we began a few weeks back from Habakkuk 3, chapter 3 there, where we saw God's judgment coming upon his people because their hearts had turned inward. They had become very selfish, uh, only thinking of themselves, pride, lust, greed, violence, and injustice had long been rotting the hearts of God's people. And so God spoke to them through his prophet Habakkuk, and he clearly articulated to them what was to come, the judgment of which was to occur upon them. And we saw in that chapter, verse 17, the scripture said, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, or no cattle in the stalls. In other words, everything, everything of which you have been trusting yourself within, everything of which you've been providing for yourself, your livelihood for, for your families, everything in which you've been using to, to create a name or a reputation for yourself, all that you use to measure yourself up against other people, all of that, all of that is about to be taken away. The news was devastating. And I've been asking you the question, what do you do when you reach a point in your life where you feel like things are so bad, they could not possibly get any worse. Perhaps in this room this morning, there's somebody who's going through a particular season of life. Maybe it just started recently. Your heart has been broken. Tragedy has visited your life. That of which you once cling to 
excuse me, clung to for the purposes of security and identity and acceptance has been stripped away from you. And you don't feel like things could possibly get any worse. Well, what, what do you do? Well, in this series, I've been showing you the praise of the Lord that God always has the last word in any situation. I began this series with a premise that it's not over until God says it's over. And so we saw that last week as we looked at the resurrection. The disciples had fled Jesus, had abandoned him in his greatest time of need before them. And they thought all was lost. He had been arrested, that was bad enough, but now he's been killed. Things went from bad to worse. And they've scattered, they've gone back to their places of of homes and, and businesses and believing that everything that they had thought was going to happen, in fact, was not going to happen. And, but then three days later, <laughs> and it's so cool, three days later, what Jesus told them would happen, in fact, did happen. Our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, came up out of that grave and is alive today, praise the Lord. So God always has the last word, and it's not over until God says it's over. So when it appears that things couldn't possibly get any worse, when you appear to feel overwhelmed and don't know what's going to happen next, remember this, when all is God, excuse me, when all is gone, God is not gone. I saw somebody in the news this weekend they were interviewing him because their house had been completely flooded. Water still has not even left the home. And the phrase he used, I don't know if he meant it literally, but he said, we put everything we had into that home, and it's all gone. See, the perspective that Scripture is showing us today is that when all is gone, God is not gone. We have him. And we see that vividly in scripture. And so many of us would acknowledge we've experienced it in our own lives. Let me tell you about Jamie. Some of you know Jamie. We first met Jamie back in October of 2014. The phone rang and young lady on the other end asked if it would be possible that she might be able to get some food. We discovered that she was staying at the Relax Inn. I'm not sure why they call it that. It doesn't seem very relaxing. A church in the area had paid for a couple of nights for her to stay there, so we took a couple of bags of food to her. And as we typically do, we take the time to hear somebody's story, and our hearts were deeply touched by her story. The circumstances in which Jamie had been through over the years of her life were more extreme than many of us in this room have ever experienced. At that time, she was seven months pregnant, and she was alone. She had no one. In the midst of difficult circumstances, she was choosing life for her child, and we recognize that, and so we as a church family came along beside her to, to minister to her, to pray with her. And so through the help of Life Choices, we found her a, a place where she could stay and be safe. And the baby was born December the 27th, 2014. A beautiful, beautiful looking boy, Jackson. Unfortunately, exactly two months later, on February the 27th, 2015, Jackson died. I happened to be at the hospital when the doctor took Jamie back to a private room and he told her, I heard the doctor say it, Jackson died of a rare respiratory disorder. There was nothing that could be done. Things had gone from bad to worse. 
the pain of which she had been experiencing for so many years just now was added onto, and like a heap of additional pain was dumped into her life. And quickly she felt overwhelmed and unable to cope. But she wasn't alone. And God has the last word. And through this church family and the ministry of life choices, she found friends and support to minister and to care for her. Fast forward to today. And in two weeks from this Tuesday, Jamie will be graduating, is the word they use, from Mercy Ministries, a ministry that reaches out to women who have suffered some deep hurts in their life. She has found God in the midst of all of her pain. She is a better person today, but she still needs friends and support. I want you to think, if you would, we first met her October of 2014 in a hospital room by herself, pregnant seven months, no support, no family to, uh, to be able to care for her. In two weeks, she'll leave Mercy Ministries, a better person, but she'll be alone with no support, with no family to support her, no birth family, that is, but she does have a church family. And I am asking you, church, would you join me in praying and seeking what God wants this church to do for her life in such a way as to be an incredible testimony about how God never leaves you alone. So pray for Jamie. Just think of Jamie. Even if you don't know her, just think of her name. Write it down somewhere and pray for Jamie because we need a plan. In two weeks, we, we, we believe that God will provide a place for her to stay. We'll need furniture for that place for her to be able to stay in. She'll need food to be able to eat. and she, We need to find her a job. and We want her to have full-time employment where she can begin to care for herself. And This will allow her to be able to have every chance of being able to be successful in life so that she won't go back to any bad habits or past experiences. This is what we do as a church family certainly when they're one of our own, and Jamie is now a member of this church. So pray for Jamie. And just as we believe God has the last word in all situations, we believe he will have the last word in hers as well. Last week, we considered the power of the resurrection. We saw the hope beyond our troubles, and we saw the anticipation of deliverance. That church, when we minister to people in this community, we begin to bring the power of the resurrection into their lives as well. They begin to see see hope beyond their present circumstances. They begin to anticipate deliverance. And if you've ever gone through a season of life where you felt trapped, burdened, overwhelmed, then you know the incredible need that it has to be in a person's life to experience hope and to anticipate deliverance. Today, we're looking at the promise of the Spirit. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus says some words to his followers of his day at a time where they desperately needed him. And I just told you, Luke chapter 16. That is what I wrote down. But it's not. (laughs) Give me a few moments. Where did Jesus say to them? It's on the screen, right? Do you have it? Did I put it in the PowerPoint? But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. You don't have that? There you go. Follow the screen. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, and this is Jesus' word speaking to him now. This is, remember, this is Jesus. He's, he's telling them ahead of time. He's, he's been told them ahead of time, by the way, remember, of his death and the resurrection. They, they didn't buy into that. 
And he's telling them, I'm going to go away yet again. Unless I go away, the counselor, he says, will not come to you. The counselor, that's what we're focusing on this morning. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and, and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. You see, Jesus had to leave. You might say, well, wait a minute. He just came back to life. Hang around for a while. I mean, have you ever met anybody that made a profound impact upon your life? And you, you just fell in love with them. You liked them. You wanted to hang out with them more and more. Only one day to have them come along and say, I've, I've got to go. And you're crushed. You're like, no, 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 no. I can imagine these thoughts and these men's thing. what do you mean you're going to go? But he has to leave. Why? In order for the spirit, God's spirit, the counselor, helper, and other uh, uh, verses say it has to come. He will send him. So what, what does all this mean? It means that we're not alone, praise the Lord. In the midst of our difficult circumstances, in the midst of our times of being overwhelmed, we are not alone. In Acts chapter 2, we in fact see the Spirit of God come upon the people in such a profound impact upon them that it was noticed by other people who didn't even know who God was. And last week, if you remember in verse 18 from Habakkuk, I told you where the prophet had found joy in the Lord. He says, even though, remember the, the, the judgment is coming, even though there'll be no figs, there'll be no olives, there'll be no crops, there'll be uh, no animals, small or large, even though I will rejoice, he says in verse 18, I will rejoice. And then I want you to see what he says in verse 19. This is on the screen as well. The sovereign Lord is my strength. This is why he can rejoice. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Now, I want us to look at that verse a little more clearly in relationship to this whole idea of what it means to, to not be alone and to have God's spirit living within us and, and available to us. The counselor the sovereign Lord is my strength, he says, regardless of what happens. He's saying this, even though, even though a severe famine will come upon this land, even though an enemy is going to overtake us, even though some of us are probably going to lose our lives, he says, verse 18, I will rejoice. Now in verse 19, he says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. And what's he talking about? Well, He's talking about two things. One, the strength to be sure-footed even during difficult times. The strength to be sure-footed even during difficult times. He's referring to it being as sure-footed as a deer. Deer are known for their incredible balance and stability even in the most difficult terrain. That's why those little things are able to hop out of those woods right across in front of your car and into the other woods across or in through a ditch, and they just jump. Have you ever noticed that deer do not jump like we jump? You know how we jump? I mean, if I bring each of you up here and I say jump down to there, you're like... And some of, and some of the students get up here and do a flip and jump down there. I mean, I would look at it and say, why? I'll take the steps. Deer, have you noticed they don't plan their next step? I mean, have you ever seen a deer stop and plan? I mean, other than the time they're caught in your headlights. They're not planning then. But they don't. Have you ever seen a deer running through the woods, suddenly go, mm, and scratch their head, think, I wonder which way I should go. They just go. And wherever they go, somehow their feet always seem to land on firm ground or in such a way as where they can remain steady. They navigate safely through the greatest of heights and among the steepest of cliffs. They have these limber, impact, excuse me, compact bodies, but they have these long, powerful legs that are suited for walking and running and climbing through rugged terrain. You see, a deer doesn't pause and have to plan the next 
step. The deer, actually, if you think about it, when you watch a deer run, runs with his head held very high. He has an incredible confidence about him. It's as if he has this idea that something or someone will purposely set his foot in secure places. And that's what God is promising to do for you and me. His spirit will guide our steps. Psalms 37 says, If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. The prophet declared his trust in the Lord to make him sure-footed. Even in the most difficult times, though the enemy was about to attack and his people would be killed or taken into captivity... Though there was a severe famine on this way, he knew his hope in the Lord would provide the strength necessary to make it through each and every difficult moment that was before him. Therefore, not only could he rejoice, but he could stand with his head held high with the confidence that the Lord was guiding his steps. Because look what he said next. He says, it enables me to go on the heights. The second thing is not only the strength to be sure-footed even during difficult times, but also the strength to be victorious regardless of the circumstances. He specifically says the Lord will provide the power to climb in the heights. In other words, more than just merely enduring, he would actually be strengthened through the difficult circumstances and be better for it. Now today, when we think about climbing to heights, we think about a, a hike up to the top of a mountain to see a scenic overlook, or, or we think about the adventurous sport of rock climbing. It's amazing what some people do when they will literally climb up the face of a cliff, and sometimes without any ropes at all. And they, they just climb for hours till they reach the very top. But adventure sports had not quite come into the view yet in the day of time of this writing. And so the people of the prophet's day understood heights as being a very difficult or a challenging place. It was not something you would necessarily aspire to, in other words. He's pointing out here that his Lord would enable him to make it to, in other words, his Lord would actually put him there. Think about that for just a moment. If these heights are difficult, challenging moments in our lives, and God enables us to get there, God put us there. God has allowed us. Why? Why would he do that? I thought he was a loving, gracious, kind God. He is. He's so loving, kind, and gracious that he will not leave us where we are. He will allow us to find ourselves in places of challenging moments. Why? So that we ultimately can depend upon him and see that we cannot make it through life without him. Perhaps... The prophet had confidence that his people in the midst of their suffering would cry out to the Lord to save them. Perhaps we should be thinking about this idea when we find ourselves suffering in this life as well. That it's really not about us. That maybe what we're going through, we're going through so that God can use our experience in order to help somebody else out. Think about it, if we didn't go through challenging times, if God didn't use these moments to awaken us to his ever-presence among us and his power available in our lives, not only would we, not only would, would we, but so many other people in this world today would continue to remain in sin. And ultimately they would die and end up in hell. So God uses, God uses our difficult, challenging times in life 
to be able ultimately not just to bring us to himself, but also, also to bring glory and honor to himself as well. I wanted y'all to welcome Bruce McGee. Bruce is going to come this morning and share his testimony. Bruce has gone through some challenging days, and he wants to share with you how gracious and good God has been. See if that's on. It's on. Can I hold it for you? Good morning. Uh oh. Brother Bill. What's wrong with it? It went down. <laughs> oh, it's the possessed one. Sorry. It's going to keep doing that. Okay. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 7 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but one, only the ones who does the will of my Father. Who is in heaven? Many of you will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I know some of you are wondering why I led off with this verse. Let me explain. February the 18th started off as a normal day for me. I got up, went to work, went by and visited Kirk Taylor like I do about every morning. Went home to work, no problems. Got home that evening, lay down and rest for a little while, then went to the night shoot. Bye. Let's go down. <laughs> went to the <laughs> night shoot for the reserve unit for the sheriff's department. I'm a member in. Went by and grabbed me something for supper. Went home. Later on that night, I started getting sick, got to feeling real bad. I called my brother John, who lives next door to me. Him and his wife were in the rushed me to the emergency room. As we pulled up in the emergency room, everything went dark. It's like I was pitch black. I fell off in a cave, a hole or something, and this hand reached out and grabbed me. And with this real voice that sends a chill down my spine even to this day. It said, this one is mine, and started pulling me toward it. The next thing I know, I look up, and I see my brother John's face, and he tells me, you have had a heart attack. They installed two stents. You're going to be fine. To this day, I know that I went off into hell, that I fell into hell, that if I had died right then, I would spend eternity in hell. I have always considered myself a Christian, but I never left the Christian life. I was what I call a spectator. I stood on the sidelines and let others do all the work. To me, coming to church meant get up Sunday morning, be here by 9, leaving after the first service, and that was it. I never took time to fellowship. I never took time to pass the word of God on to others. I never stayed for Sunday school. I never come to church on Sunday nights or Wednesday nights. But God used this heart attack to prove to me, show me I was doing my life wrong. And if you want to see what the power of prayer will do for you, just look at me. Several times the doctors came in and told my family I had less than 12 hours to live. My brother John called all my family, called all of you here at Calvary, called all his friends, my friends, called everybody they could. I had people praying for me from South Carolina mm. to Wyoming to New Mexico, all over the states of Louisiana and Texas. <laughs> One night the doctors came in and told me, told my family I had a fever of 105.2 degrees. That if it got to 106 I'd have permanent brain damage, which my brother said that's impossible. He don't have a brain. So I <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in the, there visiting me circled the bed and prayed for me. When John and Brenda got home, they prayed again. My fever the next morning was down to 99 degrees. As I was weaned from life support and finally able to speak, 
I told John, Brenda, and had them call Brother Bill and show them what God had done for me. And as me and Brother Bill talked, I gave my life back to Jesus. The doctors told us, told John and Brenda that there was nothing else they could do for me here in Ruston, and I needed to be sent somewhere else. Calls were made to Shreveport, and there was no bed. At that time, Sheriff Mike Stone, Chad Alexander, and Kirk Taylor came in the room. And with the help of Buddy Terzia, they got me into St. Luke's in Houston, Texas, which is world-renowned for heart surgery. On February the 27th, I flew out of Ruston to go down there, and March 1st had quadruple bypass surgery. I am here today by the glory of God. There's no doubt. He has plans for me, or you wouldn't have the devil, may the devil turn me loose. If today is my last day on this earth, I know now I will spend eternity in heaven. Mm. I hope what I have told you this morning will be a realization that God wants us to be participators, not spectators. Thank you. I promise you we'll get you a different stand for the second service. Trying to concentrate on him, but I just kept watching the stand. He's going to slowly sink. Is that not a great example of a God who says, not yet? <laughs> Hold on. I, I get the last word in this. See, our God is telling us today that even though we don't typically understand why we go through some of the most difficult moments in life that we have to go through. Why we have to suffer sometimes as we have to suffer. Why we cannot fully comprehend all of which he's trying to accomplish through these bad experiences. He uses them to strengthen us, to correct us, to, to discipline us. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians for our light, the momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In 1 Peter, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, these times of suffering oftentimes bring us closer to God. It causes us to see where we stand with Him. And we need to know where we stand with God. You need to know where you stand with God. You ought to have the same kind of confidence that Bruce has right now. And if you don't, I pray that you do go through some kind of circumstances. I, I don't want anything bad to happen to you, but if that's what draws us closer to God, then so be it. And praise the Lord, let it be. Because there's no better place than to be drawn close to God and to be in His family, to be one of His children, and to know that we have eternal life. You see, you were made for the height. God made you to go through these times of suffering. Why? So you can greatly identify with him and his suffering. So if God allows you to enter into a time of valley experience, understand that it's probably for the opportunity for you to experience him in a deeper way than ever before. And that's what David experienced when he was being chased by his enemies. In Psalms 18, he says, It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. In this series, I've shown you that even though we will experience bad things in our lives, even though things can, in fact, go from bad to worse, we are saved. Jesus is our Lord. We belong to him. And today... Even though things may go from bad to worse and we may feel overwhelmed, remember this, you're not alone. Jesus said, I have to go and I will send my counselor, a counselor to you, your counselor. He's your spirit living in you. It's God's spirit living in you, but he belongs to you now. He dwells in you, Scripture says. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Next time you feel overwhelmed, beaten up, 
know that you're not alone. You have the Spirit of God living in your life. And also, God even uses our times of suffering to persuade us to turn from sin. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Psalms 119 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I will obey your word. Perhaps the prophet understood that it was too late for revival among his people. They had squandered such opportunity by mocking and criticizing his message. So come what may, violence and destruction, he would still trust in the Lord. And so can you do the same? Can you, in your even though moments of life, find yourself trusting in the Lord? Can you by the Lord's own words, they are given to us in, in John 16, where Jesus says, I send a counselor to you. Can you see that you are not alone? If you're here today and you're going through some pretty bad stuff right now, you're, you're not alone in that. Even more so than having a church family and some loved ones and good friends there with you. You have the Spirit of God. If you are a child of God. If not a child of God, then you might very well be alone. But you're only alone to the degree that you're willing to acknowledge that you are. And if you would just realize that around you there is a God and He's working in your life and He's working in such a way as to draw your attention to Him. Why? So He can show Himself to you. And He wants you. He wants you to surrender your life to Him. The prophet didn't sink into hopelessness or despair. Rather, he became filled with anticipation and joy. That's what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find ourselves, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, the ability to be able to anticipate what a deliverance to come, what the joy that we can experience. Why? Because we have our God with us today, and we can trust in Him. And just as He places the, the hoof of a deer onto the ground of some of the most difficult terrain in this world, He can place your foot and my foot in exactly the right place so that we ultimately can reach the the heights of which he wants us to soar upon. That is our God. And if you don't know him today, we ask you to consider surrendering your life and making a commitment for him today. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your spirit to do your bidding among us this morning. I just, I just wonder perhaps what you have been speaking to the hearts of each person in here this morning. Perhaps there's some in this room who need to seek your forgiveness. They've made commitments to you in days past, but they have not been fulfilling those commitments. They have promised to avoid and flee from sin, but have in fact been participating in it. Perhaps in this room, Father, there's some who need to turn away from sin this day. Perhaps even for the very first time. And to choose Christ as Savior. Perhaps also though in this room. There are many. Who need to make a decision very similar to that of what Bruce said. No longer wanted to be a pretender anymore. But now wants to be a participant. And to truly truly walk the life that you've called us to walk oh heavenly father awaken us to the reality of our relationship with you and may we may we want more of you in Jesus name amen this morning as we sing this time of invitation is open
The altar is available. I'll be here as well. Other Stephen Blaney's right here. If you, in fact, I'm, I'm going to ask Stephen to stand up here as well with me this morning. I just want to encourage you this morning. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It could be a good thing. But if you just, if you just like to pray with somebody this morning, I want to encourage you to come up this morning. Either meet with Steve or myself or just come to the altar. Just spend a few moments in prayer. We invite you this morning to come. Would you stand as we sing? Just as I am without the one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb. Of God I come, I come, just as I am and waiting on to rid my soul.
praise you this morning for being the God that you are. And thank you for your love and thank you for Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Do you have a closing song? Hmm? Is there a closing song? Or? Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to say, before we close out, with <laughs> and even go, there's not a song. We are glad you're here this morning. I pray that you will be staying for time of Bible study and life group this morning, opening up the Word of God, hanging out with others to be supported and encouraged to grow in the Word of God and to grow in our walk with Him as well. And I also want to encourage you, if you wanted to talk with somebody or something you wanted to pray about, and we weren't real comfortable coming up a few moments ago, after this service is over, Steve and I both will be here for a few moments, and we would love to spend a couple of moments with you, talking with you, and anything we might be able to help you with. One other th announcement to make this morning, uh, I just was uh, uh, informed of this uh, before this service began, but Miss Judy Pilot has apparently chosen, or God has chosen, I should say, has brought a, uh, a young man into his life, her life, what did I say, his life? Oh, y'all should have been in the ceremony when I had him and her do the opposite vows. Woo. Um, tell me your name again, though, I forgot. Blaine. Blaine is here, and you can't miss him. Um, he, he, knows, he knows the heights. <laughs> but the two of them will be married in just a few short weeks. So this okay, congratulations. I was all giddy and excited about all that. Then she dropped the bombshell. She said, and we'll probably be, or will be, not probably, we'll be moving to Forest, Louisiana. And I, yeah, I know it. I know it. So you've got a couple weeks left to, choo to help her to understand why this is a bad choice. They should not get married. Clear. You're not selling the house. We don't want the house. We want you. <laughs> okay, okay. No, we are excited for you. Uh, just pray for them if you would, though. Judy asked us to pray for her in the next few weeks and such. They're going to have a private ceremony. Uh, but uh, just wanted you all to be able to celebrate that as well. Thanks for being here this morning, students. It's a joy to have you here with us this morning. May God bless you. All right. We're actually done a little early, so you can head down towards wherever you head towards, but please don't burst in a door should there be a group meeting in there, okay? God bless you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, look at that.